um, uh, respondents. So the first respondent in this particular judgment, the, the case number is J427 stroke 2020, was uh, the DMRE minister. And then the second respondent was a chief inspector of mines. And then the third respondent was a copter minister. As you would remember, that minister used to write um, everything in terms of disaster management act. And then we also had the Minerals Council of South Africa. So if you read on this case, you can see it, it, it talks to the codes of practices, which are, uh, are part of section uh, nine of the Mine Health and Safety Act. So in other words, we're talking about an environment where there was the highest level of dispute, which was not just at a, you know, outside court, it ended up in court and then the court made pronounced this judgment uh, on the 1st of, of May 2020, which was, uh, um, you know, Workers' Day, as, as we know. The next slide, uh, Ashraf. So the snippet here actually tells us as to who has to be part of ensuring you know, um, that there is health and safety in the workplace. And you, could, you can see under a bullet uh, 3.1 that uh, there is a, the Mine Health and Safety Council. And those of you who are not in mining, uh, Mine Health and Safety Council is designed to conduct certain roles and it was enabled by this act where you find the role of the chief inspector of mines and um, other subcommittees there and the board, as well as um, ensuring that the minister is advised by this particular body. Then you'll see again, there is um, an expression of, um, despite that this was a novel virus, that there were certain opinion leaders that should have been consulted in trying to figure out how to make sure that the workplaces are safe. And then, of course, you will see the, in, in bullet three that there were also other, you know, related parties here, you know, not only uh, the, the last respondent, which was the Minerals Council of South Africa, but going broader than that. So you can see that particularly in mining, there are other jurisdictions where Occupational Health and Safety Act, um, you know, has jurisdiction, but in mining, it, it's very, very particular that there is a code of practice that must be uh, complied with. And there is also a process of uh, um, ensuring that these codes of practice go through various stakeholders. So the section 82 of Mine Health and Safety Act actually says the exclusivity of um, the labor court in so much as uh, the matters that relate to to, 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 to mine health and safety, that in other words, health and safety issues in the mines. That's why this labor court judgment has been so impactful, just reminding us that despite the emergency, there are processes that must be followed and going back to what the Bulela has already mentioned, that you cannot ignore any stakeholder and, and the roles. Uh, you can go to the next slide that also has some of the issues. Um, this was also a, a cross, uh, cross, uh, cross cutting issue relating to um, people that had certain you know, designations uh, insofar as their well being as being vulnerable to this novel virus. And you know that there was it was really a big challenge because we had to deal with livelihoods and rights as well as uh, lives that were at stake. So various um, uh, uh, stakeholders had to be brought in to deal with this particular matter. Even in the last stage, we had the, the tiers, which was basically employer relief schemes that were dealing with this complexity of uh, uh, workplace health and safety. Thank you, Asra. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Malimela. Um, so um, I, I've uh, I noticed th there is this additional slide. I'm not sure if you wanted to perhaps deal with this later on. So I'm going to stop sharing this for the moment and just introduce 
and get to our next uh, panelist, and that is uh, Ms. Alare David uh, from Hospesa. And to quickly, if I can just find my, there we go, I think I found it. Um, uh, go to the question I have for you, Alare. Alare, welcome. Thank you very much for making the time in, and joining us today. So my first question to you is, What's the cost of underreporting occupational health and safety incidents or transgressions um, where the hazards are um, affecting workers and if they don't report it? Um, um, yes, thank you, Ashraf, and good morning to everyone. Um, so we find within the health sector, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because workers are supposed to report for their own good. But the system is so burdened, and so I don't like to use the word broken because we are the system as workers as well. But honestly, for me as a health sector worker to report a transgression, it becomes very cumbersome. So often these transgressions are left unreported. Um, there are so many issues, but specifically um, the most, um, the one that is really close to my heart is TV because health sector workers currently are dying of TB, occupational TB. And we know um, when we look at the number of reported cases, specifically for occupational TB, it's very, very low. So a worker would rather choose to seek health privately using their own medical aid, um, as opposed to reporting TB as an occupational disease. Um, yeah, so there are, when it comes to underreporting, we do know that it leaves um, workers exposed because if you don't report something, uh, often the transgressions will continue happening. And just as the other panelists were speaking, I, as a worker in the health sector, I become so jealous because it seems like the the workers within mining sector, everything seems sorted. You know, there's compliance, there are legislation, there's guidelines. When it comes to the health sector, we are still very behind because clinics can't close, um, hospitals can't close, you know, the inspectors can come and inspect, they can tell us what's wrong, but it's an environment where the, the work must go on. So often those workers are forced to work in an environment that is not safe. Um, Yes, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, yes, yes. So, so, so you, you kind of allude to the burden of um, occupational health and safety non-compliance as well. So let me ask you, I mean, did that burden the rest on the shoulders of workers? Um, what needs to be done for them to sort of be in you know, a safe working environment? All right? So, so I think within the health sector, definitely the burden rests squarely on the shoulders of workers because we find that the environment is of such a nature that um, the same worker that is responsible for the health of others being the public is also responsible for their own health and safety. And with the system being so fragmented, you, you find pockets of excellence. So you find places where there are occupational health and safety clinics that speak directly to workers and that run excellently. But throughout the country, um, there are places where workers do not have access. So it becomes very, it becomes a, a big burden because often we find that workers have to take the responsibility for their health and their safety at work. Um, and this is not fair because often um, you have to use your own sick days, you have to use your own medical aid, you have to use your own resources. Um, to remain safe at work. Um, we do know that within bargaining councils, for example, health and safety is on the, the agenda. But if you look at what is discussed and what is fought for, it's often just, it ends with PPE. So people think if a nurse has got a mask that she's protected. Um, and that's not all health and safety is. So we, we're struggling really with the employer, if I can say, both public and private to put in place a robust occupational health and safety program inclusive of risk management, also inclusive of ongoing monitoring. So something as simple as vaccinations is not being done. 
So vaccinations against hepatitis, for example, that all health sector workers, from the nurse, the doctor, to the porter, to the cleaning lady, even to the security guard working within a health facility, these workers need access to something as basic as that vaccine. This is not happening. So yet, once workers become aware of their risk, the burden rests rest now with workers, and you find workers going to private doctors to get these vaccines, as opposed to it being implemented routinely within the work. Thank you. Thanks for that. So, so, so uh, clearly you focused on at least two biological hazards, right? It was TB, and I think you mentioned hepatitis is very big. Um, so, so in the health sector, and it might be in other sectors as well, where hepatitis might be an issue, depending which type of A or B and so on. Um, the key thing here is you basically are highlighting the sort of failures of, in the system or the shortcomings and the gaps, and clearly indicating that compliance is not 100%, and I'm not sure if it's completely 100% in the mining sector either, but um, so therefore the question is, you know, what are the roles and the responsibility of workers, their representatives, and I am thinking both of shop shoots and elected health and safety representatives in promoting a sort of culture within the workplace where compliance in fact is regarded as important in terms of workplace culture. Is that right? Yes, so, so I would say um, the roles and responsibilities of workers. So the Act speaks um, clearly to the roles of workers. So um, just to paraphrase basically what, what the role of a worker is, it is to remain safe at work, also to make sure that your colleagues are safe at work, to follow any lawful instruction. Um, and this is where often the problem comes within specifically the context of the health sector. There is various um, legislation, but there are not enough occupational health and safety policies. So if you look at provinces, each province has its own autonomy. So provinces are allowed to um, have their own occupational health and safety guidelines, obviously following from the Act. Um, and you find a province like Western Province, um, and I hate to, to make an example, but Western Province has got a policy that works. Um, so does Gauteng Province. But in other provinces, you find either the policy is non-existent or, or workers are not aware. And the Occupational Health and Safety Act alone has got various gaps that do not, does not speak to workers. So one, one thing where I can say workers are responsible and maybe we are lacking is the function of shop stewards on occupational health and safety committees. So here you find often um, as a worker or as a shop steward, we are signing off things that we should not be signing off. We are letting go of transgressions that we are not supposed to. Often it is because um, we are not aware of the risk or it's because of pressure, from hospital CEOs, sometimes from the Department of Labor. Um, there are various, con there's various contexts, but the bottom line is the right workers have on those committees need to be access exercised fully. So the committees do sit, they're supposed to meet at least once a quarter, um, but does this happen at all institutions? And the answer simply is no. And if it happens, um, is there enough resources? And the answer simply to that is no. Thanks, Thank Andre. You. Yeah, so, so uh, in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, rather uh, a related legislation with regard to employee rights is the Labor Relations Act. And in one of the previous webinars, we had uh, also a Labor representative indicating that Section 14.4 of the Labor Relations Act uh, gives shop stewards the right to monitor the employer's implementation and compliance with all legislation, and that would obviously include health and safety related legislation. Um, Dr. Manimela, if I could ask you, uh, in, in terms of, uh, and, and we're now into sort of general broad discussion and, 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 and questions, I'm hoping to just see if there's any key questions from our chat box, uh, Q&A box, if we can deal with. Uh, but Dr. Manimela, is there a responsibility on the employer to create that culture and environment where compliance is strengthened? 
workers know what their health and safety rights are. Uh, as a manager and supervisor, I know what my responsibilities are. Uh, we know what structures they are, as Elra has just indicated. Um, is, is there an important emphasis um, on the employer's responsibilities to ensure that uh, the uh, functions are followed and the rights are in fact uh, abided by? Dr. Malamela? Yeah, thanks, Ashraf. We, we're lucky um, that Mine Health and Safety Act is very, very, very specific. It has got duties on employees. It has got duties on employers. It has got duties on the tripartite structure. Hence, you, you find the definition of Mine Health and Safety Council, as I, I glossed through, that in that structure, you've got labor represented, you've got employers represented, you've got government represented. All these parties work together to develop standards that will be, um, you, you know, um, uh, applied in the workplaces. And when you go to the level of the different employers, you've got health and safety structures. In fact, this court ju judgment that I put mentioned that there must be consultations with those health and safety structures. In addition, there is obligations on the employer to train all employees on matters of health and safety in the workplace. So, so as I said, despite that this was novel, whatever was known at the time had to be shared, whether known or unknown. Mm -hmm. So, so Mine Health and Safety Act has, has, has so many things. I mean, Section 49 itself ensure, you know, obligates the chief inspector of mines to actually produce these guidelines. So, so, well, so we've got a very good, yeah, for, for health and safety in the workplace. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Malamila. We're in the last two minutes of our webinar, and I want to ask if uh, Ms. Huna Polelwa, if you could just address the following question from one of our attendees in the Q&A box. Our Department of Labor Inspectors required to be registered with the uh, South African, uh, is that SACP CMP? I think that's the South African Construction uh, um, uh, uh, project management, I think, uh, professional body, SACP, CMP. Are, are inspectors required to be registered anywhere with a professional body? Ulewa? At the moment, professional registration is not required for any of our inspectors. At the moment, they are doing it voluntarily. But even so, even if they are not registered, the legislation empowers them to conduct their work even checking what the professionals are doing. Because often out there, they'll be told that they are not registered. So they are not required at the moment to register. It's voluntary for them to do so, but they're still empowered to do their work. Thanks. Mm. And uh, Dr. Malimela, in the mining sector, is there any requirement for uh, the inspectorate, those who does enforcement and inspections uh, to be registered with any professional body to ensure continuous professional development and you know compliance with ethical codes? Yeah, the, it's actually indirect, but in fact, um, there are sections in the Act um, that impose on who are the people who should be given the roles. And that means competence in terms of technical qualifications. For instance, if you are a doctor without occupational health, you cannot be appointed <laughs> to head or to lead um, a certain legal appointments within mining industry, because there is that specification that one must have a postgraduate qualification. Then you've got the medical inspector is defined in the law uh, that that is a medical doctor advising the chief inspector of mines and also doing inspe inspection. Then you've got the medical inspectors and you also have environmental inspectors. Each one of these have got recognized qualifications for their uh, you know, eligibility for appointment. So that is the indirect implication of uh, professionalism that is required because it's um, a very wide area. It's not even just one discipline. It's, uh, it goes to interdisciplinary, yeah. multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary. But all those are chemical, chemical and a whole lot of stuff that you've got to deal with yes. in the mining sector. Okay, so thanks for yes. that. Funny. A last question to you, um, uh, Ms. Puna. Um, Bulewa, there's a question. Has there been any discussions or consideration or contemplation within the Department of Labor about issuing spot fines for non-compliant entities? 
Uh, that's the last question to you. And then I'm going to have your, your final take on messages. So has, has there been consideration of spot fines for non-compliant entities? Bulewa? The bill, the OSH bill, when it was published last year, it did address the issues of spot fine. At the moment, that's still a draft until the bill is finalized. So the technical committee under the advisory council is working on those comments. So once everything is finalized and all the processes have been followed and the president has enacted, and then we'll start uh, implementing spot fines. At the moment, it's just a draft on the bill. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm gonna start with you, Bulewa. You know, tw in 20 seconds, what's your take home message to the workers in the workplaces, the people that rely on the health and safety reps, the health and safety officers, the shop shippers, the supervisors, managers, the medical and nursing uh, specialized staff in the workplaces and the Department of Labor inspectors. What is your take home message to workers to strengthen compliance in the workplace? And obviously to employers, if you wanna add that. Bulewa, 20 seconds. Thanks. For all parties uh, that we have mentioned, uh, uh, Ashraf, we need to remember that as Convention 155 and 187 are now as fundamental uh, conventions, we need to work together to make sure that this fundamental right in terms of OHS is ensured and maintained in the world of work so that all persons in the world of work are protected. So I would also like to borrow from the words of Maya Angelou Ashraf. Now that uh, we know what we need to do, we know better, let us do better until we know better and then we improve. Because in the field of OHS, it is always continuous improvement. We cannot remain stagnant. Thank you. Thank you. That was 25 seconds. So, <laughs> but thank you, Bulewa. Much appreciated your input and your contributions. Uh, 20 seconds for you, Dr. Malemela. What's your take or message or the most important key theme that you may want to leave with our audience? Please proceed. Yeah. What it says with health and safety in the workplace is that everybody matters and there is one goal and one goal only, which is to have healthy employees will return to their families well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manumela. That was short and sweet and giving you a couple of seconds there already. All right, so what is your take home message uh, to your members, to the fellow workers, to the employers, you know, supervised managers and all those that we mentioned earlier, how do we strengthen compliance in the workplace? 20 seconds. Um, yes, so I would say consultation. So we have the processes, we have the structures in place, be it NEDLAC, be it bargaining council, be it multilateral um, meetings within workplaces. Consult workers. Workers need occupational health and safety systems that work for them, that are implemented with workers in mind. Um, yes, so that would be good be my take on consult workers on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you also mentioned earlier, just this one key point that stuck in my mind, that people are not enjoying their compensation benefits so far as compensation yes. leave and the payment of bills or medical bills or other benefits that they are entitled to. So yes, clearly, there's lots for us to do to improve the culture of a protective and preventative culture of occupational safety in the workplace. And on that note, I want to say thank you very much to our three panelists, Ms. Bulel Wahuna, Senior Specialist in Occupational Health and Hygiene in the Department of Labor, Dr. Jameson Malibela, the Senior Vice President for Health and Employee Wellness at the Sibania Stillwater, and then uh, Ms. L. Ray David, the Deputy Manager for Education and Gender at the Hospesa, uh, active in the health sector. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And for our audience, we, our next webinar is on the 20th of April, dealing with hazardous biological agents. Um, and I would assume the regulatory framework and everything related to that. We will be sending out to you the invite for that particular webinar. So thank you for joining us today and goodbye. See you on the next webinar. Yes, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.